attorneys and publication side. Uh, we, for 42 years, we have been an advocate in the courts and the regulatory agencies for principles that are supportive of free enterprise, job creation, wealth creation. Uh, capitalism is not a bad word here at, at Washington Legal Foundation. And we're certainly proud of, of being able to, to be out there uh, for many years advocating those sorts of, of ideas. Um, our, our program today is, is one of our uh, briefing programs, which is part of our, our communication side. We also have a, an active blog, the WLF Legal Pulse, where we publish a, a wide range of, on a wide range of issues, both in-house attorneys and out-house, out of WLF attorneys as well. Uh, and we hope you, if you're online with us today, you spend some time paying attention to, uh, to what we're up to, sort of from a larger perspective. Is consumer data both that which we, as online browsers, share about ourselves and that which can be gleaned from our browsing habits, the new oil, or as one of our speakers today has asked, is data more like renewable energy? Does data in and of itself constitute a market for merger review and other antitrust regulation? Is data an essential facility? When can an entity's collection of and use of data constitute a barrier to entry? When sh or should a company's consumer privacy policies be a concern for the antitrust law. There's a lot of catchy slogans being thrown around, a lot of intriguing questions being asked, not only in traditional antitrust law and economic circles, but also in high profile political circles, even including presidential debates these days. We're honored to have with us today an attorney who has extensive experience with these questions, both as a former Federal Trade Commission commissioner and acting chairman, and as the head of her firm's antitrust practice, and an economist who has studied and written about the intersection data and antitrust extensively. I'm going to introduce our speakers first and then we'll provide a, a brief uh, opening statement and then we'll have a question and answer session if you're online with us today. There is a Q&A widget next to the screen that you can use to ask questions. They'll come directly to me and I'll ask them to the speakers. Leading off today will be Maureen Olhausen, who is a partner with Baker Botts, where she is practice group chair of antitrust and competition law. Before joining the firm, Ms. Olhausen served as acting chairman of the Federal Trade Commission. Prior to her role as that and as commissioner, Ms. Olhausen led the FTC's Internet Access Task Force, headed the FTC practice group at a leading telecommunications firm, and clerked for, the, for a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. In July, we're proud to say that Ms. Olhausen accepted an appointment to Washington Legal Foundation's Legal Policy Advisory Board. Joining Marine today will be Alex Stapp, who is the research fellow at the International Center for Law and Economics, ICLE. His research interests include technology policy, antitrust, and data privacy and security. Mr. Stapp's work has been cited in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and published in Salon, CapEx, and the National Review. Before joining ICLE, he worked as a technology policy fellow at the Niskanen Center in Washington, D.C., and as an MA fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University in Arlington. Prior to that, Mr. Stapp worked in operations at a startup company in Phoenix, Arizona. Maureen, if you could get us started. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for having me. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it really has become such an incredibly hot topic, antitrust, how should it look at data, consumer data, uh, as if these are all totally new debates, as, as if they've never been considered before. And one of the things I wanted to do at the beginning of my remarks is consider how antitrust has looked at data about and created by consumers previously, because there really is a track record there of how antitrust uh, agencies, antitrust enforcement, has looked at these issues. So in a merger context, or even a conduct con uh, context, the antitrust agencies have typically looked as data as an asset. Okay, it's an asset, what, what can it do? For example, information about consumers allows for more precisely targeted advertisements. That's one of the things that's actually driving a lot of the churn, I think, today, is the fact that online advertising, particularly search advertising, has a lot allowed better targeting of advertisements. It's made that type of advertising more valuable, and it has been at the expense of more traditional advertising channels like newspapers, TVs, magazines things like that and we're seeing a lot of um, unhappiness uh, from the people who you know now their advertising uh, channels aren't as valuable. Um, data can also be an input. Uh, it can support and enhance products and services. So you think about if you use um, uh, an app like Waze that helps you with dynamic traffic uh, directions, uh, the, the data is an input into creating that 
um, into that, that product. So lo looking back uh, over the history of antitrust, there are some areas where there's been a, you know, a fair amount of antitrust analysis involving data about or created by consumers. So if you look at residential real estate records, there's a series of FTC cases examining mergers of companies that are going to be combining uh, data sets involving these residential real estate records, and the FTC actually recently challenged a merger in that space. A consumer credit data, uh, that's also been uh, subject to antitrust analysis. Uh, one case uh, more recently that I'd like to highlight is the DOJ case as a merger challenge against Bizarre Voice and Power Reviews in 2013. And this was a merger of platforms for consumer-generated online reviews uh, and ratings. So this is data generated by consumers. Um, and DOJ argued that the deal reduced competition, that there were high barriers to entry. And the remedy that DOJ imposed was to divest the overlapping um, assets. So use, looking to data, particular types of data, even data about consumers, is really nothing new under the U.S. Anti antitrust laws. Um, and sometimes there's even been the remedy of sharing data as, uh, as, an, as an antitrust uh, remedy. For example, there was the Cox Automotive Dealer Track case uh, where these were two uh, big data sets. Um, and there were concerns that post-merger, the company could restrict competitor access to this data. And the remedy for the merger was to require the uh, Cox to share the vehicle data service, uh, vehicle service data with, with competitors. So again, these are not unheard of kinds of concepts in antitrust law. But I think we need to think carefully about under what conditions is data sharing a remedy in U.S. antitrust law. It's where merger remedies are necessary to address overlaps in specialized data that's hard to obtain. And I think that's one of the fundamental issues we need to think carefully about with consumer data or data about consumers. Is that data that hard to obtain? We have data brokers, yeah, we have consumers you know, interacting all the time through various channels. And so I think one of the important questions is to say, is this data actually uh, that hard, hard to, to obtain, or is it just easier to try to get it from your competitor using antitrust uh, as, as the, the tool? Uh, are the data assets absolutely necessary to compete? Is this the only way in which competition can occur in this marketplace is by having access to this particular data set? Not whether it's convenient, not whether it's you know, your easiest path to competition, but is it absolutely necessary? And will it create a highly concentrated market post acquisition. Um, so I think those are some of the important uh, fundamental concepts to look at if you're trying to use antitrust as a tool to force access to uh, consumer data that companies hold. Now we're hearing a lot of calls for forced data sharing um, from a, a wide variety of, of, um, of commenters. Uh, Europeans uh, have talked about, oh, it might be a worthwhile remedy to address data monopolization by large tech companies. One of the dynamics that we're seeing is with uh, GDPR and California's privacy law and you know, all the um, uh, push towards greater privacy laws is it's actually creating um, conditions where there may be less data collected, less data shared by companies, um, we see that possibly as a good thing, giving consumers more control, uh, more consumer sovereignty uh, over their data. But on the other hand, it's creating um, perhaps some scarcity in some types of data. I still have questions whether there's true scarcity, but at least you know relative to, to the pre-GDPR, pre-CCPA. Uh, so as a response to this, some of the antitrust agencies are saying, oh, mainly in Europe, oh, well, then we have to consider that we should force these companies to share this data because there's going to be a competitive effect. And um, in the U.S., this really came to an interesting head in the HiQ versus LinkedIn case that I'd like to touch on briefly. So in that, so LinkedIn is um, a social, um, uh, it's really like a business networking site where people put up information about themselves and it's a good tool if you want to make connections, uh, it's also very useful for recruiters 
who want to see uh, is somebody with this particular skill set available in the market and to pitch jobs to them. Uh, but LinkedIn has particular terms about how people can get on the site and take data, you know, user data off the site. And they make promises to consumers who use their site about whether their data can be scraped and shared in, in those different ways. So HiQ is a company that was crawling the LinkedIn data site, scraping the data, and using it to create a tool uh, that it sold to a lot of employers. And that tool identified for employers employees who seemed likely, uh, were likely looking for a job, right? So perhaps that's not something that a consumer who's using LinkedIn really wants <laughs> to, uh, you know, someone creating this uh, sort of alert system for their, their um, employer that this person may be looking for a job. So LinkedIn, it violated LinkedIn terms of service, and so HiQ was accessing LinkedIn site. It had to have permission to do it. And it, uh, LinkedIn sent a cease and desist letter to HiQ saying you're violating our terms of service by accessing our data this way um, and you, you have to stop. And um, HiQ uh, filed a case arguing um, under a variety of things, uh, including uh, that this was uh, an essential facility that this was a competitive issue because LinkedIn was going to create a similar, was in the process of creating a similar type of product, uh, though with the uh, user's permission to whether to, to let <laughs> certain people know that they might have been looking for a job. Um, and the district court granted the injunction to HiQ saying, well, you will need access to this data to compete so therefore, the balance of the equities favors granting the injunction, uh, even though they hadn't had the trial yet on, on the, the actual merits of the case. So that got appealed up to the Ninth Circuit, who recently issued a decision upholding the injunction. And the interesting thing in that decision is it talks a lot about, well, HiQ has to have access to this information. It's made promises to uh, its customers it's going to supply the data in this way. And this data is available on the website, and we don't want to allow big data monopolies, so we're going to say that the, the equities tip towards having, um, requiring that um, HiQ be able to get this data. Now, the thing that I found most interesting, or one of the most interesting things about this decision is that in no way recognized the individual consumer's interest in how their data was being used. The idea that if a consumer shares a data with a website for a particular purpose, that then for antitrust reasons um, and some other reasons under California law, the courts were going to force LinkedIn to allow it for all reasons. The, it, the opinion makes no mention of consumer interests, privacy, consumer types of concerns. So I thought that case showed how uh, this push in antitrust, uh, which a lot of it is often driven in the idea that, oh, companies have too much power, they have, you know, we want to you know, um, give consumers more control over their data. A lot of these antitrust approaches and remedies will actually give consumers less control over their data. So I think it creates an interesting um, conundrum. I'll just uh, finish up t touching briefly on the uh, German case against Facebook. Uh, where they, the Bundeskartell Amt had a decision saying that because Facebook is a dominant player and allegedly violated the GDPR and combined uh, data from different sources, uh, that it abused its dominant position as a social network uh, and that was an antitrust violation. And its proposed remedy was going to uh, require Facebook to get additional consent from consumers. Now, the regional court suspended the Bundeskartellum decision, and I think it, for a very, very important reason. And what it said was only, it's only an antitrust violation if it involves any competitive conduct that's causally linked to the firm's dominant market position. So just because you're a big player and you might collect a lot of data, and some people might think, well, does that... Um, does that comport with the privacy laws or not? You, that doesn't automatically translate into an antitrust violation. Uh, so I'll stop with that. I think uh, lot, lots of interesting topics to talk about and lot, lots happening. The LinkedIn decision was fairly recent. Uh, the German decision was fairly recent. So I think uh, 
many more uh, things might happen in this space. So thank, thank you, Maureen. You. Alec. All righty. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to the Washington Legal Foundation for inviting me today. Uh, thank you to Commissioner Olhausen for your comments. It's wonderful. Uh, today, I want to talk primarily about uh, a meme you might have heard uh, among in tech and politics. The meme is, data is the new oil. Uh, you might have heard this if you watched the most recent Democratic debate. Uh, candidate Andrew Yang said a version of this, said that da our data is now more valuable than oil. Um, a New York Times op-ed series, it was a video op-ed series by Jaron Lanier. He's a tech visionary with Microsoft, so he often makes public pronouncements about what's trending in tech. Uh, he made a video series that argued, among other things, that data is the new oil. Uh, and he also predicted that in the near future, uh, the average American family of four people will be able to make $20,000 a year based on selling their personal data. Um, I'm going to talk later about why I'm skeptical of that claim, but that was in the New York Times. Uh, and then also, a few weeks ago, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi was visiting the U.S. trying to drum up business or you know, improve international relations, and he's speaking in Houston, Texas, and he said that data is the new oil, data is the new gold, and American businesses should come to India because they have the lowest production costs for data. Um, so after hearing all of this, I decided to dig deeper and really examine the similarities and differences between data and oil. Um, there are a few similarities, things they have in common. Uh, both are intermediate goods, right? So they're not usually final goods and services delivered to consumers. They're used as inputs in a production process to make some final good and service. Um, and they both need to be refined before um, they can really be valuable both inside a company or as part of some final deliverable to consumers. So that's what they share in common. Uh, people may often use the phrase, they also like to think that they share in common, that they're both very valuable. Oil is valuable, gold is valuable. Data, I'll talk about why I don't think it's actually that valuable. Um, so I think, and I think there are differences, primary differences, about seven primary reasons why data is not the new oil. First, oil is rivalrous, meaning that if I use a barrel of oil or a gasoline of oil, uh, then somebody else can't use it. But when I share personal data with a company, I can then give that exact same personal data to another company I'm interacting with, often in exchange for free services. So this is like the ultimate free lunch in economics, that you can just keep using the same data over and over. Um, oil number two, oil is excludable, meaning companies can prevent others from consuming their data without paying. So they can store it in secure facilities, they, set, they transact in the open market, and they can make sure that the oil gets delivered to who it needs to be delivered to. Um, data is generally non-excludable. So I'll, I'll caveat this by saying that data sets and databases, kind of you can license some proprietary means, those can be partially excludable. But the underlying data, the personal data that you and I share that goes into those data sets and gets structured, that data is not excludable. Like I mentioned, you can just give that repeatedly to different people, and they can incorporate it into their own business processes. Now I'll pause at these first two reasons because those two factors, being non-rivalrous and non-excludable, make, make data and what we, in economics we call a public good, or like a quasi-public good. And what we also know from economics, that means that uh, the narrative around data, that companies are over-investing in data production in an attempt to gain some kind of monopoly over data in a certain market, that's likely not the case. If you can think of data as a quasi-public good, that means companies are likely under-investing in data production because they can't capture all the profits when they create new data. And so that would incentivize us to think about how we can expand the use of data in the economy, not limit it. Number three, oil is fungible. So one barrel of oil is as good as any other. That's a key part of why it functions well in commodities trading markets. Um, data is not like that. Each data set is unique, and that's why some critical data sets are very valuable, but others are relatively worthless. So you have to really examine the data set and know what you're buying before you pay anything for a data set. Uh, number four, oil has positive marginal costs. So the cost to produce an additional barrel of oil uh, is significant. It varies from $5.49 in Saudi Arabia to $21.66 in the UK. Um, and that's just to produce the next barrel, so that doesn't include the fixed costs that go into drilling an oil rig. Uh, data in general has zero marginal costs, you know, just copying bits, ones and zeros. So once you have the first data point, uh, if you need to use that in multiple instances, you can just copy it over for zero costs. And again, what does that tell us from economics? That in a highly competitive market under perfect competition, price equals marginal cost. And what do we see in the marketplace? 
data often has a zero price to it. Um, so we're often seeing that marginal cost equals the price for data. Uh, number five, oil is a search good and data is an experience good. So a search good means that I can value the product ahead of purchasing it. Uh, I know when I go to the market, when I'm buying one barrel of light, sweet, crude oil, I know exactly what I'm getting as a customer. Uh, but data is an experience good. Oftentimes, a business needs to incorporate a data set into an ongoing production process to realize how valuable it is. And so that means that ahead of time, ahead of a purchase, you might not be sure of whether data is actually valuable to you as a customer. And what that means for policy is that purpose limitation rules can backfire. Uh, if you limit what, what kind of data companies can collect ahead of time, then they might not search every avenue or possibility for productive use of data because they don't know ahead of time exactly what kinds of data from consumers they will need. Number six, oil has constant returns to scale and data has diminishing returns. So oil is a relatively constant returns to scale product if you think of it as an energy input into a mechanical process, right? If you add more oil, the machine will just go for longer and you'll proportionally get more output um, in your production process. But data, as used in algorithms today, machine learning algorithms, has diminishing returns. Uh, there's a lot of good academic research on this um, that uses industry data, but it shows that algorithm improvement kind of starts out steep and then flattens off over time as you add new data because the initial training data is super valuable, but as the data training set grows larger, a lot of the data is duplicative. It doesn't improve the actual accuracy of the algorithm, so data has diminishing returns. Uh, and number seven, the final, final difference. Uh, you combine all of the first six factors together and what do you get? I think this is a really important point is that oil is valuable. So I checked this morning the markets. Uh, West, West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil is trading for about $55.03. Um, the best data we have from the data brokerage market, this is according to a Financial Times article, finds that the average person's personal data is worth less than a dollar. All the data about you, the personal data that can be bought in the open market is worth less than a dollar. I think some of their specific examples were kind of interesting and enlightening. Um, so they said that your general information, your age, your gender, your location, that's worth about $0.0005 per person or 50 cents per thousand people for that kind of information. Um, more particular data that can be more valuable to some kind of business, like knowing a woman is expecting a baby and is in her second trimester of pregnancy sends the price tag for that information to about 11 cents. That's the super valuable data um, that's only true about certain kinds of people. And then I know a common critique to this as well, there are different quantities and units. Well, what is one barrel of oil? Is that equivalent to one person's data? So you want to also you can look at the entire, the total market size for data and oil. Uh, so very rough numbers, but the oil and natural gas global industry is $2 trillion. The global data broker market is $110 billion. So we're talking about 20x difference roughly uh, in total market size for data and oil. And lastly, I want to talk about, so then why is this meme, why is saying data is the new oil so popular? I think it's because people look at the market and they say, well, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, these are worth hundreds of billions of dollars, if not a couple of them are trillion dollar companies. I give them data uh, in exchange for free services, but am I getting the short drift here? And I think what people are not recognizing or ignoring when they make these claims about data being so valuable is that the tech companies combine highly skilled labor, enormous spending on research and development, and huge spending on capital expenditures. And they add data to that to improve targeting and, and their advertising businesses um, and to give you free services that engage your attention. Data is only a small part of that. And I think it's strange and strange, strange credulity to believe that we then deserve all of the profits that te the tech industry um, produces. And lastly, so why does this matter? Okay, maybe somebody's just like making a bad analogy and they think the data is valuable, but it's actually not. I think it actually has real world uh, potential negative consequences if policymakers take this analogy too literally. If they regulate data like a commodity, that's going to tend towards the kind of solutions or policies that think of data as this scarce thing that we need to like, divide the spoils of. When really data is a quasi-public good, and we need to be thinking of ways to incentivize more data production and more data sharing if we want to grow the internet economy. Um, and lastly, 
Uh, as Glenn mentioned, I think a better, again, but still imperfect analogy would be renewable energy. Renewable energy, solar, hydroelectric, wind, it can be used over and over and over. It's limitless so long as you can capture it. So we're really just bounded by uh, the quality of technology and the infrastructure to capture that energy. And the same is true for data. If we create the right incentives and have the right technology, we can capture data and create a lot more value along the way. Thank you. Maureen, would you like to add anything uh, based on what Alec had to say before we do some questions? I think the only, I appreciate your remarks very much. And I think the only thing that I would add is uh, the parties who keep repeating uh, oil is uh, data is the new oil and who are, I think, some of the biggest uh, advocates, as I said, are uh, the media, right? And they are the ones whose um, ability to um, capitalize, to monetize their properties has been um, impacted by the, new, by the new tech companies. So uh, I, I think uh, perhaps they are not uh, simply just parroting a clever phrase. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they, have, they, have a, they have a dog in the fight, right? And so I think that when we look at, for example, the FTC's enforcement action in the 1-800-CONTACTS case, uh, which was about 1-800-CONTACTS um, agreeing with, a, I think, 12, 13 other online competitors not to do keyword search advertising against each other's trademark or negative keyword search also, which was very clear that there wasn't confusion, trademark confusion there. A, a big part of that was uh, the FTC's final decision in that was because how important and how valuable search advertising has become in reaching consumers. And so there has been this shift. Uh, and so I think there's uh, concerns uh, about that. So kind of keep a, you know, a little skeptical eye and keep, you know, ask who, 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 is, who is characterizing things in this yeah. way and what are their interests? Yeah, I think I'll follow up on that. I'm, I'm really sure, glad you brought up uh, the news media's role in this. I wrote about this recently in a piece for TechDirt responding to uh, New York Times op-ed by Matt, Matt Stoller basically claiming that Google and Facebook have killed uh, the news industry in the United States. Um, and I, my basic response to him was I think that he's um, mischaracterizing exactly what happened. I think it's the internet killed the news industry because their business model had become dependent on advertising. And you know, in the first half of the 20th century, newspapers, local newspapers basically had a monopoly on information distribution uh, in their local markets. And so advertisers, anyone who had to, wanted to get a message out to the local community had to go through newspapers. And they're able to use those nice profit margins from having a local monopoly to subsidize things like investigative journalism. And when you sell a bundled product like a newspaper, which includes everything from news and sports um, to classified ads and personal ads, the investigative journalism is a really uh, useful and valuable addition to that bundle. But when the bundle fa falls apart with the introduction of the internet, and also in addition to the rise of radio and television, uh, investigative journalism is much less profitable on its own. And so I think you see this now as a, as a crisis in journalism, um, but really it's just as technology has changed, business models in the news industry have not kept up. And we're seeing experimentation now, and I think we all agree that we're hoping that there's a sustainable solution. Um, I'm just skeptical that government protection, government intervention of the kind that Matt Stoller and his New York Times op-ed advocated, I'm skeptical that that's actually the solution. Yeah, when, when you think uh, back to it, I don't think anyone would think of Craigslist as a mega tech company, but Craigslist was one of the early um, uh, sort of undermining of the newspaper's business model because it took classified ad, mm -hmm. uh, you know, adver um, advertising, re reduce the, those revenues. Um, I think one of the important things uh, to consider is also Look, we may all care about journalism and want, you know, these you know, benefits that, that we get from that, but, you know, what's the right tool to get that? And is antitrust enforcement really the right, the right, right. path? Exactly. I'm going to play off of the Haiku uh, example for, for a bit. Um, that, that sort of brings up the larger question of can you find the right balance between business practices that are geared towards protecting consumer data and situations where keeping that consumer data more private or, or creating your own uh, product like uh, LinkedIn is doing here goes to some competitive concerns. Like for instance, recently YouTube announced that it's not gonna be uh, giving access to third-party tracking pixels and it's created its own uh, ads data hub. And that certainly 
advertisers will say that that's, that's locking out their ability to, to compete on Google's platform and it's benefiting Google in a certain way, Google will say, well, we're trying to protect the, the privacy of, of YouTube users. Is, there, is, is that going to be an di increasingly difficult balance to strike? Oh, a absolutely, because uh, as I mentioned, there are these strong co cross currents where so GDPR gets enacted, oh, it's wonderful, it's terrific, it's you know, all things to all people, um, but one of the documented impacts that it's had is a competitive one. And if we don't understand the competitive impacts of some of the privacy regulation, you know, we won't optimize consumer the benefits for, for consumers. Um, certainly, um, access, the, the idea of competitor access to your platform, to your data, to your services is becoming a very hot issue. Um, I, in a, a case that was not in the tech area, um, but again came out of the Ninth Circuit, um, called uh, Swisher versus Trendsetter, uh, um, just recently filed a, a brief in this, well, I was the counsel of record in a brief in the Supreme Court for an economist, uh, but it raised this issue totally outside the tech area. It had to do with the manufacture of cigarillos. Uh, so Swisher had been manufacturing cigarillos for its competitor, Trendsetter, uh, decided it didn't want to do that anymore. Trendsetter sued, saying uh, that it had to, um, you know, under Aspen skiing, it was a refusal to deal, violated the antitrust laws. Um, and, you know, this is the kind of thing we're going to see over and over again with these kinds of arguments that um, the platforms are powerful, I need access to them to compete, uh, therefore they must share with me and under what terms and what conditions and if they are saying, well, it's for privacy reasons, um, you know, consumer privacy reasons, you know, how do you factor that in? Yeah, I think uh, I, I agree with Commissioner Olhausen, and I think there's definitely a real trade-off between privacy and competition. I would just separate them into two like analytical buckets. I would think of the Google case as you know the private companies, private actors, they're making their own decisions about how they serve their customers. And so I would say one, I I think it's reasonable that uh, increasing privacy protection would uh, help Google consumers, um, and there might be a competitive trade-off. But that's the beauty of the consumer welfare standard, right? In the current uh, policymaker toolkit, you can look at that and say, well, we'll adjust prices or adjust things for quality and privacy protection is a dimension of quality. So I think the current standard can incorporate that and analyze market behavior um, to see if it's any competitive, whether it's a change in privacy or any other change in quality. That's one bucket. Um, and the other bucket I would say is regulation. And so this is where policymakers who are involved in passing new regulation, I think should just be wary and consider un potential unintended consequences, which we've already seen evidence that um, a decrease in competition and an increase in concentration is one of them with privacy regulation. There's actually new research today. Um, it's only the latest in a, in a series of reports showing increased concentration in Europe. Um, but there was new research from Garrett Johnson at Boston University and Scott Shriver at Columbia University. It's a, a new working paper looking at GDPR um, using a difference and differences technique on the advertising market there. So just saying like what happened right before you passed GDPR, how was the ad tech market functioning in Europe and how was it functioning immediately thereafter? And what they found was a 15% decrease in ad tech vendors uh, in that market and a 17% increase in the relative concentration in the ad tech vendor market. And what I think this does is it shows us how we can hold two things in our minds at the same time. People say, if this is good for Facebook and Google, right, if it increases concentration, if it's good for the biggest players because they can comply with new regulations, then why are Google and Facebook, you know, advocating for less stringent regulations or why do they seem opposed to GDPRs? And I think the resolution this research shows us is that it's about absolute and relative changes. The absolute market is shrinking for advertising in Europe because they're labeled to do less things with consumer data, but the relative share of Facebook and Google is going up. So it's good for the big guys relative to the, back, the little guys, but it's bad for everyone when the total industry shrinks. In terms of the, of the value of, of, of data, um, Alec, you had mentioned machine learning, which I'm glad you did because that sort of gives me an in on this. Some would argue that the massive amount of data that is needed to, to train a machine and make it effective in, in creating algorithms is not something that I think that a, a new firm could possibly do even through purchase of, of, of data. 
So what's, what's the response to those who say we need antitrust law to come in and make data more of a, more of a public good, as you, as you said, but doing so by forcing companies to, to make data available to others? Yeah, I would say uh, look at recent market history. I think a great example here is TikTok. It's, for those who aren't familiar, it's the latest social media craze. Um, it already has over a billion users worldwide it's owned as a Chinese parent company. Um, and when they started less than two years ago, I believe, uh, they had no data whatsoever. And their key competitive advantage is actually the machine learning algorithm that recommends videos to you. So it's a social media app like Facebook, but it's only videos, no pictures or text. Um, when you open the app without following anyone, connecting with anyone, so without it really having any of your data, it immediately starts showing you videos. And then based on whether you, how long you watch a video for, they're short, like 15 second, 30 second videos. Um, if you watch it for a long time or you like it, um, based on your behavior within the app, it starts recommending you more and more videos that are similar to that thing and customizing the feed to your liking. And this is the biggest app in the world right now in terms of pace of growth. Um, it's not owned by Facebook. So there's competition. They're using machine learning algorithms. They're able to get data from actually consumers using their app. And so I think that shows that this is still a dynamic market. There's still room for change. And it's not clear at all how long Facebook will be dominant with um, these kind of apps. Um, switching over to a little bit to the, to the merger side, is, what's, what's the argument for and against the fact that we have something called a data market, that, that there is something that, that uh, merger review uh, officials should take a look at in terms of that's the market, the data is, the data is essentially the market. Is that something that we're going to see more of, or, or is that that's still too nascent to really put a finger on? Is this the where that's going to go? I think the antitrust agencies are under pressure to do a very careful analysis of anything that touches on any of these issues. Um, so for example, when a Microsoft bought LinkedIn, that got cleared pretty quickly in the US. It took longer in Europe. I got cleared there too, but because they wanted to see what the privacy implications were. Uh, but, you know, there's, as I mentioned already, if there is a definable data market and there's head to head competition that will be reduced through this merger and uh, entry isn't easy, and I mean, like all the usual kind of things you would look at, you know, that could theoretically be a grounds for blocking, for blocking a merger. Uh, but then that's not really remarkable. I mean, right. I think the thing that we're seeing, though, are these concerns of, what we would typically consider an efficiency in a merger, right? Where you've got one asset and you're merging with somebody else and you don't have head-to-head -head competition on that, but putting those two assets together is going to allow you to create a new thing, right? You're going to have an improved product. You're going to have a different product. You're going to you know, do it more cheaply, some, something like that. Um, and I think now we're starting to see concerns as if, well, if it involves consumer data, that third thing is a bad thing. Right, that's a reason to block a merger. Whereas previously we would say, oh, a merger that creates an efficiency that lowers prices or helps innovation, or you know, it, it's not uh, creating entry barriers other than the entry barrier of you know competing hard and, and you know coming up with a you know an improved product, and uh, we we want we want that. That should be the outcome of a competitive market. Um, so things that used to tip in favor of a merger could now, oh, if it's consumer data or it's an asset that involves consumer data, should somehow stop, something like that. And th those are some of the concerns that I think uh, are, being, are being raised. Now, um, you know, an agency can have a theory. They can even bring a case. Uh, you know, they'd have to win it in court. But given, uh, I mean, as I said, some of the real... Uh, uh, dynamics like going back that's not a merger case the high linkedin case certainly suggests there's some um interesting things happening in some of the circuits when you when you say it's data it sort of right. changes the changes the analysis yeah i definitely just i concur with commissioner olhaus and i think um it's interesting that data is the hot new trend but it really should just be treated like another asset and anytime one firm monopolizes a critical input whether it's data or anything else, that, that can raise any competitive concerns. Um, but I don't think there's necessarily anything unique about data that warrants a whole rewrite of, of rules um, or complete rethink by uh, antitrust enforcers. And then I think just in terms of how we think about mergers uh, with data concerns, I think the Facebook, Instagram acquisition is a good example here, how people might think that 
They had a lot of similar kind of social networking data. Could this be a problem in the merger? And if you look back and read histories at that time, um, Instagram was growing very rapidly, but they had no monetization to date. Um, there were signs that growth might have been slowing because um, they didn't have experience with you know, growth hacking, all sorts of things that Facebook did to get to their size. And when Facebook came in, they were able to add their business model on top of Instagram instantly, um, keep accelerating growth, which was not a foregone conclusion, um, and invest in the teams there. And I think that's an example of where the, parent, the acquiring company was able to leverage their internal resources, create efficiencies in the acquired company, and create a beneficial outcome for everyone. So when, when some talk about the desire to undo some of these acquisitions, like Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp and Instagram, how much is data privacy protection and data ownership going to factor into that sort of a, of a potential outcome or remedy that, that either the state attorneys general might pursue or the, or the U.S. government might pursue? Well... Though the, the topics are certainly getting swirled together in, in the state AG investigations, or they talk about it kind of as a unified theory kind, kind of thing, but um, I, I don't think you can assume that uh, you know, taking a large company and breaking it in, into smaller pieces is going to be better for consumer privacy. I mean, unless you think that just the fact that a, a large company has information about a large number of consumers who have willingly shared it with with the company. Um, uh, but I, uh, from my enforcement experience, um, yeah, there have been large data breaches at big companies and there have been large data breaches at small companies. Um, they're, often the big companies invest a little more, they're more sophisticated in some of their data um, privacy and security. And, and they also you know, are beginning to differentiate in competition, like, like certainly Apple, the iPhone, they they um, advertise quite a bit that we, you know their their model is their their business model is more privacy protective. Um, so while it, it's kind of I think it kind of clouds the waters a bit. Um, now it's a competitive issue, saying oh well this merger gave them you know accelerated their growth because it gave them access to this type of data or new data sets or something like that in a way that allowed them to, uh, you know, extend their monopoly through something that's not competition on the merits, right? So if we're looking at a monopoly maintenance, uh, you know, kind of monopolization kind of case, um, unless we're going way back to, um, you know, the Alcoa case or something and we're <laughs> saying, oh, well, uh, you know, continuing to innovate and, and, and serve consumers and anticipate their needs uh, and get to, you know, a product that they want, you know, uh, before your competitors is a bad thing, um, then I think it's going to be kind of difficult. But, but obviously there's a lot of people uh, in the antitrust world thinking, thinking hard about this. So, uh, but, uh, but I think... Uh, just saying uh, an acquisition has allowed a company to continue to please consumers, have a large market share, and move into new areas is not on its own sufficient to make out an antitrust violation that would support a breakup remedy. Yeah. And just to follow up on Christian Lawson's point about satisfying consumer demand, I think and if you're going to take some kind of breakup action against Facebook, um, predicated on the idea that you're going to increase privacy protection, I think you first want to look at the market and see if like there is a market failure here. Is there some kind of latent uh, consumer demand for privacy protection that's, that's not being met? And I think it's pretty clear there isn't if you just look at the options available today. It's not like there are no options for privacy protective tools online. Um, you can use DuckDuckGo if you don't like Google um, looking at your searches. You can use Brave, which is a browser, a privacy-focused browser if you like that. Uh, Christian Wallace has mentioned Apple products are increasingly um, privacy protective as well. And what you see in the case of those former tools that I mentioned is they have less than 1% market share. What that tells me is that the revealed preference of consumers is that they value other things much more than they value privacy protection. And then whether as a fact, that if you did break them up, we get more privacy protection. I think it's uncertain ex ante, but I'm skeptical that you will get more privacy protection just from um, kind of a mathematic, mathematical, logical sense of like, currently there's one Facebook uh, that is in charge of protecting your data. 
um, and keeping it secure, and if you break that into three or more companies, then even if one of them has a more privacy protective model and two are like Facebook or even less protective of your privacy, a single hack will bring all the data out, right? And so you're increasing what they say in the hacking community is called attack vectors. The amount of points that uh, an attacker can get into a new system by creating more companies, you're creating more opportunities for uh, hackers to get in, which is why you, know, you keep all your money in one bank. You don't put your money in different bank accounts at different places. Like it's the same idea. We should just have really high grade um, data security in large firms instead of thinking that breaking them up into little firms with less resources to protect your data will lead to more privacy protection. Well, I've been asking all the questions here. If anyone here in our, in our uh, studio audience has any questions or anyone online, I'd be happy to, to entertain your questions. Seeing that there's none, I guess I'll continue with my own <laughs> questions. Um, again, back to the high Q case, Maureen, that's, that was brought under the California unfair competition Yes. statute. So how similar is that statute to the FTC Act in, in what, what would an outcome there, uh, what, what sort of influence might that have on, on enforcement at the federal level or cases brought under the FTC Act rather than the state law? Yeah, so um, yeah, they, they are different and the, the case law is a little bit different, but I think the, the, the concept uh, with the idea that we don't want to allow data monopolies, so and this you know what the Ninth Circuit said, so we're going to say you've created a product and to have that product you have to have access to that data um, trumps the ability of an entity to design you know make a bargain with its own users uh, and and for the user's own preferences um, you know is is kind of troubling and and the and it the idea and kind of we put that together with the trendsetter case where you're seeing and I, I you may think i'm saying it Carelessly, <laughs> it is actually trendsetter. A H. It's not slang. Okay. Yeah, it's not trendsetter. It's trendsetter. But anyway, um, it uh, it is showing uh, an interest, uh, um, certainly a sympathy, to allowing um, a more, you know, uh, interventionist approach of saying if you have assets and your and your competitor wants access to them you're going to have to give access to them. So, you know, in, under U.S. Um, Supreme Court case law, under um, As you know, Trinko's interpretation of Aspen Seeing and Linkline, it's a pretty small set where you would say you, you're forced sharing of assets. The essential facilities doctrine has never been recognized by the Supreme Court, uh, but there seems to be sort of this drumbeat that essential facilities is, you know, it, the time has come um, <laughs> for it, and it seems to be based on data, which, again, kind of going back to Alex's um, um, analogies, uh, we seem to have a lot of data, right? And it, it doesn't necessarily seem to be that hard to get. Um, sure, it might be easier just to get it from your competitor, um, but it's probably easy to get a lot of things from your competitor rather than invest in them yourself. Uh, and we should be paying careful attention to the incentives that creates, you know, where the old static versus dynamic uh, effect um, in, in antitrust. Yeah, and if we're talking about the uh, essential facilities doctrine, if we're going down that route uh, in regards to data, I think it's important to distinguish between critical data sets as an input of production uh, and personal data that you and I, we all have and share with multiple companies all the time. Um, I think the thing is you just think of it as what's the exception and what's the rule. The rule should be based on what the evidence we see in the market that data is ubiquitous, that it can be shared over and over, and it's not um, an a entry barrier in most markets. And then the exception are a few rare cases where, yes, it can be an attempt to mo mo monopolization. Um, the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, we have a, a guest in the audience here, they released a great report uh, a couple years ago about some industries that you might see this kind of uh, uh, situation for. So it would be things like airline pricing data in the airline industry, like the ticket pricing data. Um, it would be something like in the real estate industry, the multiple listing services that you know, house all the prices for houses in a community. Um, and then perhaps in the banking industry, uh, customer banking information, like basic information that uh, a fintech startup might need to uh, compete in the market. I'm not saying necessarily those are uh, central facilities for each industry, but it's the kind of thing that like, if there are cases, that's where we're going to see it. It's like mostly pricing data. It's not your demographic data um, that are necessary for market competition. 
Maureen, when you testified back in July, um, your statement included a, a, a statement that if a business theoretically reduced its quality of consumer data privacy protection, that might constitute a harm uh, in the context of, of data that might give rise to an antitrust violation, uh, either in the merger or non-merger context. Can you elaborate that on, on that a little bit? Sure. So if you had two companies that were merging and they were competing on privacy attributes, um, and they were merging to monopoly and therefore they didn't need to produce the same level of quality, um, which in this case would be one of the factors of, you know, of, um, it, the quality being privacy protections. This is a fairly traditional antitrust analysis, right? You could say, well, yes, we would be concerned if two innovative drug companies who were both racing to create the next cancer cure uh, merged and then they, um, you know, said, oh, Maybe we can do that a little more slowly, <laughs> right? Well, let cancer I mean, keep going. <laughs> yeah, correct. But I mean, that's, that's, maybe that's yeah. not a great example. But, but you, know, you know what I mean. That, yeah. uh, you know, look, I'm not saying that privacy can never be a basis on which companies compete. They compete on lots of different factors. Um, if DuckDuckGo, you know, was going to merge with another, uh, you know, search engine that uh, was also touting its privacy and we could say it's a definable market and you know all the all the things and bells and whistles that go into a, a careful antitrust analysis you know then an, antitrust should should apply um, but just by saying I, I, I what I have found is that so many times where, where privacy is being brought up has to do with this company has data and that company has data and they're going to put them together and therefore that's going to be a privacy violation under like consumer protection law. So when uh, Facebook bought WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp had collected, made promises to consumers, WhatsApp users about how it would use their data. And so the FTC reviewed that merger, said, you know, they're not competing in the messaging space, uh, but we, the head of the Bureau of Consumer Protection wrote a letter to say, remember, you have to comply with those promises that you made to the users of WhatsApp when, uh, when they gave uh, you their data. And if you don't, you'll, if you're going to change that, you have to get a new set of permissions from them or you have to not use their data. And that's you know, a fairly straightforward remedy if we think that there's going to be not a reduction in competition, which is what antitrust analysis is about, but um, something that violates consumer protection promises down, down the road. Yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought up the WhatsApp case because that's an interesting example where there are tough questions about how you balance these different equities because if there happened to be a, a decrease in privacy protection, we also have to note that Facebook, before the acquisition, WhatsApp cost a dollar per year per user. Um, and then after the acquisition, it became free. So that's a reduction in price for consumers. Did away that against changes in privacy. Um, but I have seen some, some new research recently that tries to track, you know, you do redlining of privacy policies over time, and then you see those changes, and maybe you could argue that's a, a reduction in quality if the privacy policy becomes uh, less restrictive in terms of the data they can collect on consumers. But then that just like moves the ball to the next um, line, which says like, okay, so how much does that matter to consumers? And that's where you go to the academic research, um, the best like experimental research that shows um, actual consumer reveal, reveal preference behavior where they actually don't care that much. It's again, you're talking the range of like pennies um, to a few dollars people are willing to pay for privacy protection on various apps when you study this um, in an academic setting. And so I think you might be able to show a change in quality but the magnitude is very important because the magnitude might be swamped by other efficiencies. One more question. Um, the concept of breaking up firms is a very easy one to understand and sort of grasp and sounds like it has a, a, a great way to, to do things. To put it in the context of the terrible fires in California, I read one, one uh, resident of California said that we, we need to break up PG&E. The, the uh, utility out there because they've gotten too big and too powerful and, and you know, that sort of can analogize that to Facebook and, and Google and others. What can those of us who know that that sort of a, of a remedy isn't necessarily going to be uh, provide the kind of solution for data protection and other things that, that consumers think that they want, what, what's the, how can sort of we push back on that and, and explain to people in a non 
economics <laughs> sort of way <laughs> that that is necessarily, you know, be careful what you ask for sort of thing. Well, one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind is, look, we, people may have concerns about the influence of, you know, powerful interests in politics or, you know, the, you know, environmental, you know, complying with environmental regulations and, and things like that. I, it's not that those values aren't important. It's what's the right tool to address them, right? And so if you try to put into a, um, an antitrust analysis all these competing values, there's several problems you run into. One is how do you weigh consumers' uh, interest in quality and price uh, against, you know, some other interest in saying, well, we want, uh, you know, less influence in the state house or something like that. Secondly, as brilliant as I think all of us antitrust enforcers and commentators are. Smartest people. Right, yeah, yeah. Why do you think we're the right people to make those decisions about, you know, environmentalism or, um, uh, you know, political contributions or, you know, what, what have you? It's a question of expertise. Then a third problem is once you start introducing non-competition factors into a competition analysis, um, it unleashes uh, like industrial policy forces, not just in the U.S., but around the world. So we've spent a lot of years talking to other regimes around the world saying you shouldn't be using antitrust to favor your domestic industries. You shouldn't be using antitrust to disfavor you know, companies from countries that you don't, don't like. Well, when we take that out of U.S., you know, the, you know we, we take that principle away from the U.S., um, then why not have China, India, you know, the list goes on and on, say, we're going to make our decisions based on the fact that, you know, and people may say, well, some of them are already doing that. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that we want to say, well, fine, let's all just jump in, because <laughs> ultimately I think it makes consumers worse off, I think it'll be a problem for trade, uh, for, you know, industries sort of more, more broadly. So um, anyway, I, I, it's not that those aren't important values, you just have to use the right tools. And it's a democratic issue. FTC commissioners are not elected officials. Um, last week, Senator Sanders had a proposal that uh, the FTC should be able to block mergers with no judicial review. Well, you know, we have a three-part system of government for a reason. Um, I would be concerned about saying the government can take action with no judicial review. Um, and so I think we need to keep some of those, you know, sort of areas of expertise and balance of power concerns um, in mind. Yeah, and I think, I think what Commissioner Elhausen is really talking about here is a rule of law issue. Um, when we try to bring other values that are non-competition, non-consumer welfare values, into antitrust because you very quickly get inconsistent or uncertain outcomes. If you're a, a business leader, a, an executive of a company, and you're trying to either make a certain corporate decision or engage in a merger, um, some kind of behavior, you don't, if you don't know what the enforcers are going to do, how they're going to receive that information, all of a sudden you can get a chilling of competition in the market, um, and you're going to get inefficient outcomes. And I think um, we definitely don't want uh, antitrust enforcement to be used as industrial policy. If you want to do industrial policy, go do industrial policy. Um, so there, there are other options uh, using our current system of government, but uh, trying to shoehorn it into uh, antitrust enforcement because it's, because it's a stick, because it's available, and it's a pretty powerful one, I think the unintended consequences of that and the cost of doing that would far outweigh, outweigh the benefits. And finally, just on the rule of law principle, I think the best test is always to ask, would you want your least favored political rival to you be able to use that same tool? Um, so if you're on the left, would you want President Trump to do that now currently? And if you're on the right, would you want uh, Senator Sanders, Senator, Senator Elizabeth Warren to have that same power? And I think you all of a sudden would be very excited about limiting this to a more technocratic, predictable question, if you consider the question that way. One of the more interesting things that came out of this discussion, I think, is, is the importance of the the area of, of refusal to, to, to deal and uh, just put in a plug for, for WLF. We, we fought a brief in the Trendsetter case as well. That's one that the Supreme Court denied review and unfortunately so. The one to watch for is another case that we filed in via media versus Comcast, which is in the Seventh Circuit. And that decision is coming down 
I wouldn't say soon, but 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 imminently. So um, certainly that's an area with regards to, to forcing companies to share data with other companies that I think is going to be critical in how the, the uh, judicial developments go and whether Aspen skiing remains uh, good law and lower courts interpret it very, very broadly. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. If you were with us online uh, and weren't able to catch the entire program, we'll have this up as a full video uh, by the end of the day. And if you have anyone that you think would be interested in, in viewing it, just have them contact us and we'll send out the link. Thank you for joining us and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs>